said, um, I am the uh, co-founder of the ABFF. The other two original founders were uh, Byron Lewis, who is the former chairman of Uniworld Group, Inc., and Warrington Hutland. And here's how the story goes. Uh, back in 1996, uh, I was working at Uniworld as the uh, head of the entertainment division there, and uh, I had just come back from Sundance, and I was very interested in film, and uh, but working in advertising professionally. And uh, I was out. I, I invited Byron Lewis, my boss at the time, and Warrington Hutland, a, a longtime friend, and he was the head of the Black Filmmaker Foundation. Uh, I invited them to lunch. <clears throat> We're all from New York, and I invited, invited them to lunch in Soho. And I was telling them about my Sundance experience. And essentially what I said was, it's a great time, uh, amazing films. And this was back in 96, right after Sex, Lies, and Videotape uh, had hit, which was really Sundance. Most of you know that's, that was the Sundance Film Festival's breakout film. And I was talking about the films and, and the experience, and I thought it was just an amazing experience. But the one thing that uh, I did not see uh, – were many people of color, and beyond that, there weren't many films at that time uh, that featured people of, of color. Now, there's a it's a very different festival now, but we're talking about 16 years ago. So that lunch meeting essentially evolved evolved into a plan to start our own festival like Sundance that would feature African American people well, that would feature the work of people of African descent and a broader definition of black. Um, so that was January 1996. We decided to do the first festival, which was the Acapulco Black Film Festival. At that point, we decided to do it in June of that same year. So the entire cycle of, of, of conversation to planning was essentially four and a half months. And uh, I remember Byron putting up the seed money, uh, which was half a million dollars to do the first fest, and saying, you go figure it out, which is what I did. I, I made a couple of phone calls. I knew we had to have celebrities there, so I called Halle Berry, uh, who we honored that year as a rising star. And I called uh, Morgan Freeman and Bill Duke and Robert Townsend, and I think John Singleton was in that. That was our star base. And we, and this was pre, pre email, pre cell phone, really. So I'm not, what I don't remember about this whole story is how we got the word out. But we got the word out. We had uh, about 190 people show up in addition, you know, filmmakers and people from around the country. And what happened was really special. We really realized at that point that there was a need for a showcase for black filmmakers and black artists. There was a huge void in it on, on a large scale, and we all just caught the bug. We decided from that point on that we were going to continue to do this. Uh, the very next year, the, the 190 people became 800 people, and Denzel Washington showed up. And I remember Entertainment Weekly, Access Hollywood came down and covered it. And once we hit Access Hollywood, uh, I really think that was kind of the turning point from a, from a visibility standpoint. Um, and then we, so we stayed in Acapulco for five years. After the fifth year, I, I started to realize that the people that we wanted to help, the, the emerging filmmakers and emerging artists, really couldn't afford to get to Acapulco. So we decided to move it stateside, make it a bit more accessible, and we landed in uh, Miami in 2001. Which is at the same, which coincided with the point that I left Uniworld, I started my own company, Film Life, and I acquired the rights for, for the festival from Uniworld. So at the 2002 point is when Film Life became the host organization for the ABFF, uh, and I became the, I guess, the, the sole operator of it, if you, if you will. Uh, from 2002 through now, we've continued our mission, and I just want to be very clear about our mission. I had an uh, interview the other day, and um, a journalist asked me, well, what's, what's been your breakout film? And I, and I said to them, you know, unlike Sundance and Cannes, where uh, those festivals are, have made their mark, you know, by getting films acquired by major studios, you know, the reality is that major studios don't acquire independent black films for widespread distribution. That's just the, the nature of the beast. So we don't... We don't earn our stripes, I should say, from breakout film. We really want to break out people. So the festival really has been a, a platform for filmmakers, for writers, producers, directors, and actors, and executives to really make contacts, to get their feet wet in the business. Uh, and we do have some amazing people that have come through our festival. In fact, you all know uh, the gentleman from Rainforest, Will Packer and Rob Hardy. Well, they, they came through our event back in 1999 with the film called Trois. 
and uh, you know, 12, 13 years later, uh, they have the number one movie in the country for several weeks in a row. And I think the uh, Think Like a Man just crossed ninety million dollars. So you know, we, our stripes are we, you know we. we our value is based on the people we help, not you know, not a film or two being acquired. That's really how we measure our success. Uh, this year, we're having our 16th, 16th anniversary next week, beginning June 20th. Uh, we're expecting about 5,000 people. Um, same energy, same great, you know, same commitment to people, same commitment to nurturing and education and, and artistic advancement. Uh, some of our highlights, just to wrap this up, some of our highlights this year is we're opening on uh, a film that uh, called Beasts of the Southern Wild that uh, Fox Searchlight acquired from Sundance and actually it won the Grand Jury Prize at Sundance and went on, went on to win a, a similar award at the Cannes Film Fest. Um, we're having a uh, actually we're having a celebration, uh, an evening celebrating the success of Think Like a Man. We've got the producers and the directors, Tim, uh, Tim Story, and we've also invited a number of the cast members. We're going to basically have a panel. Uh, they'll show some deleted scenes, some scenes that you know, that you didn't get to see in the film, and really celebrate the success of it. You know, clearly because their their producers are are ABFF alumni. Uh, I was hoping that that film would be at a hundred million dollars by now. We'd be celebrating that one hundred million dollar benchmark, but it it'll look like it'll top out in, in the uh, in the low nineties, which is far from a failure. Uh, we're also having a conversation with uh, Salim and Mara Brockakil, you know, who we consider Hollywood's power couple right now, which should be very interesting. Um, our closing night film is a film called Raising Izzy which is a original production of the GMC Television Network, one of our sponsors, and uh, uh, starring Rockman Dunbar and Vanessa Williams. Um, we have a webisode challenge this year, and one of our initiatives moving forward is to really create a platform for digital content. So we're having a, a basically a webisode. Uh, we've had a webisode competition all year. You're going to get a chance to see who the four finalists are for that competition. And lastly, um, we're uh, launching or doing a sneak preview of a new web series that I've executive produced and that the ABFF is now in the production mode, but that we've that we executive produced here at, at uh, Film Life, and we're launching on our new TV internet network, Film Life TV. It's called the Q&A Show, and it's a, uh, a show created by a young Hollywood couple, um, young man and his wife, and they wanted to find a way to work together, so they created a, a, web, a web series, and it's a very edgy and raw sketch comedy series to put you in the mind of the Chappelle, the Chappelle show and Living Color, but uh, that's launching on Film Life TV on the 24th of this month. Um, so we've got a lot of great things happening. And lastly, and then I'll open the floor for some questions, um, we have a television show called ABFF Independent that's launching on the 27th of this month on Magic Johnson's new Aspire Network. And it's a show featuring shorts and documentaries and feature and, and independent feature films, uh, many of which that have, many of which have played at the festival over the years. And uh, actor Mari Hardwick is the host of that. So we're going to have a lot of great great new information. You know, some great people, great energies, and, and uh, you know, all of our corporate sponsors are wholly committed to. And we're going to have a very fulfilling week. Um, I'd like to take a moment to again thank you and uh, open up the floor for questions. Thank you. Oh, we we do want to talk about the um, the ambassador for this year. Yes. Oh, that's the yes. Business. The the, uh, the, the, the the one little special surprise we were hoping for to, for this group right here. Yep, there you go. The one special surprise is each year we select an ambassador, and and the uh, <clears throat> the role of the ambassador is to really pre festival to spread the word about the upcoming ABFF, but. The ambassador's role is, is primarily an on-site role. We, we select someone who will have, who has the right spirit, who is committed to art and to committed to the development of African Americans in that space. Uh, former ambassadors have ranged from, you know, Sanaa Lathan to Idris Elba to John Singleton to Anthony Mackey. Uh, this year, we've uh, we've selected Tracy Ellis Ross. We're very, very excited about having her back. Uh, she's hosted our award show a couple of times in the past, in the early 2000s, and uh, we could be more pleased to have her back as this year's, this year's ambassador. And our first question comes from Michelle Madison. Hi, hello. I am... Hey, how are you? Great. Um, well, as someone who's also producing a webisode lifestyle talk format, 
I wanted to know why this year do you think it's so important to launch the Webisode Channel? Excuse me, the Webisode Challenge. Uh, you know, this, it was an idea we had three years ago, and I, and I feel like we're late. You know, as you well know, um, the, the Internet has been the – uh, the great equalizer for me. It, it's leveled the playing field to some degree because for the, for the past, you know, 30 years, we've been pitching to the eight major networks and, if, you know, major studios and networks. And if you don't have a connection, the connection, it's hard to get your story told, your script read, your show Bible reviewed. So the Internet provides a platform for everyone to be successful. And and I was surprised, Michelle, at how many people have webisodes. I mean, just like we, you know, we started the HBO short film competition 15 years ago, and the first year we got 100 shorts, you know, I was really surprised that we got 90 or so it, uh, webisode entries this first year. So we try to stay ahead of the curve as it relates to that kind of stuff. Uh, I do feel like we're a few years late, but I am, you know, I am very pleased that we are, you know, and engaging and, uh, and, and, and um, encouraging people to make digital content or content, you know, ideal for digital distribution. Well, I think you're on the right track. And my last question, so some may argue that with the success of black women um, in the business, like Mar Rocka Keel, Queen Latifah, and Oprah, um, as far as black women in Hollywood, why do we need the panel discussion on this and what can we expect from it? Well, let's not forget Shonda Rhimes, first of all. And, uh, I think you just have to keep things topical and have to keep things top of mind. You know, I, I had a, a talk with my uh, friend Suzanne DePass the other night, and she, you know, she's done everything, as you well know, and she's been in this business 35, 40 years. And, she, and from her point of view, not much has changed because she doesn't measure. What she said to me is, I don't measure the success of black women by the success of four people you just named. So she thinks that it's very, she's got the same challenges she said she had 40, 30, 35 years ago. So uh, I asked her if she, what she thought about, we were talking about the same topic of this panel, and, I, and she just, in her opinion, was it's just as necessary now as it was then because there are very few opportunities for black women, um, you know, just based on, the numbers, very few opportunities for black women to, to be successful. And, and you know, not, not, how, how many black women are, are, are uh, members of the Directors Guild and, and those and Producers Guild and those sort of organizations or on the, the board of the Academy. So I think it's as relevant as it, as it ever was. Okay, well said, and thank you, and I look forward to meeting you next thank week. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Our next question is from Shalinda Janine. Hi, Jeff. How are you? I'm great, Chilin. How are you? I'm fantastic. So my first question is, do you think that Hollywood is starting to finally change its thoughts towards black films with movies like The Help and Think Like a Man or the Tyler Perry uh, franchise ruling the box office? No, I don't. I, I think that uh, – well, I don't think this. It's the facts are the facts of the facts. That Hollywood – has shifted towards films that play around the world. And if you look at any the lineup of any major studio, what you see over the past 10 years is the number of films they make are decreasing and the types of films they make are starting to point towards big budget movies and, and, and you know, Spider-Man and, and Avengers and, big, you know, very universal stories that will make $100 million to $500 million worldwide. And what is what what's been affected most are the niche films like the films of the 90s that I remember like the best man and soul food and how Stella got a groove bracket and the preacher's wife I mean that I didn't realize and that's when I really got bit with the film black film book in the 90s and I didn't realize how good we had it then and anyone on this phone has been tracking I'm sure many of you have we had 15 16 black movies a year in some good years I mean we did a list a couple of years uh, last year and they were, in 94 95 96 there were 15 movies that, you know either either starring directed by or targeted to a black audience and you just named Tyler Perry think like a man and you know there you know we'd be we'd be stretched to get three or two or three the last three or four years. So I just think the, the, the industry is going away from niche. I don't think it's about race at all. I think it's about money, you know, and uh, we've got to find new ways to get our films out. Okay. And my second question is, you made such an impact in the film industry. You've had everyone to participate from Spike Lee to John Singleton. Is there any one actor that you still haven't got that you just are holding out for, that you just are so hopeful to participate with? Festival in the upcoming years? Uh, we've had most people. We have not had Will Smith there and Eddie Murphy. So if you guys know him, give him a call for us and tell him that we love them both 
and we'd love to have them there in the future. But I think those might be the only like really mainstream black artists that we have not had participate in, in the 15 years. So if you know I'm calling for me, please. Okay, thank you so much, Jeff. Okay, thank you. 